Clay, this is maybe not the most exciting way to start the episode where the Borg return to Voyager or return to the franchise, I suppose. And mm-hmm. they kind of return to Voyager, I guess, if you're counting that last episode where we saw the Borg in the bush. But anyway, this is two of how many episodes that Robert Duncan McNeil, Tom Paris himself, directs in Voyager. This is the second of how many episodes? Uh, are we using... We using that confusing metric we used last time, where it was in chronological order, but not past the date that we've watched. No, the, how many episodes? Reverse? How many episodes does he have left to direct in this uh, this, this um, series? Four. He's got two left, four total. Ah. So you're, I'll give you half a point. He does four. He because I might have asked you uh, in the opening how many he directs, but it is four, and this is the second one. So what was the first one? Sacred ground. Don't ask me to. That's the um. I think that's the horrible. Uh, is that the one where Janeway looks Chakotay's at the portal? Gra- oh, okay. I just assumed that was the Chakotay's grandfather one, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't remember. Couldn't tell you. Let me hold up. Let me find Sacred Ground. Sacred Ground. Yes, it's the one where Kess touches that portal, and Janeway has to go and like and sit in that little. Kess is injured when she accidentally commits sacrilege on an alien planet in order to save her. Janeway must go through a mysterious ritual that challenges her faith in science. Kess is always out there touching portals. We we both gave that one a one. So, uh, <laughs> Robert Dunk, R- Robbie Duncan, Robbie Dunk McNeil is Bobby uh, Dunks. Bobby Dunks. What a great New England name, Bobby Dunks. Yeah, I don't think he's from New England, but we can all hope. This is Unity. The 17th episode of the third season of Star Trek Voyager came out on the 12th of February, 1997. It is the third of three in the Necrot Expanse arc. You're going to remember this arc, Clay, aren't you? The Necrot Expanse. I will hope there are books written about it because I feel like there's so (laughs) So much much left on the table. So much left unsaid. (laughs) Although, apparently, well, we'll get into it. Written by Kenneth Baylor, directed by Robert Duncan McNeil. In universe dates 50614.2, which is 2373. In Unity, Chakotay is injured and trapped on a world where the inhabitants are embroiled in conflict, but the people who rescue and care for him harbor a disturbing secret. Before uh, before we get into this, mm. <clears throat> quick little Bobby Dunk story. Sure. Uh, uh, on Badass, the most recent Badass that we recorded, we were t- ended up talking about Masters of the Universe for quite a while. Sure. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> Sean uh, enlightened me to the fact that uh, he Bobby Dunks is is in that movie. Oh, he is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, Courtney Cox's boyfriend. It was one of those things where it's like I never thought about it, but as soon as he said it, he's like Tom Paris. And, like I did the <laughs> visual face math in my head, and I'm like, oh my god, yeah, that is him. I'm thinking. So, you you think it, you saying Courtney Cox? All that popped in my head, interestingly, when I was trying to place Tom Paris there, was I thought of Scream with um, who? What's what the hell's that actor's name? The guy who the one who plays the killer in Scream with Courtney Cox. Uh, he plays Shaggy uh, in Scooby Doo. Oh, Matthew Lillard. Matthew Lillard isn't Tom, isn't isn't Bobby Dunks kind of a, a poor man's Matthew Lillard? Or is Matthew Lillard a poor man's Bobby Dunks? No, I think Matthew Lillard has too much energy to be a Bobby Dunks type. I think I th- I'm thinking I think Bobby Dunks is. I've said this before. He's got big Bruce Davison energy. Okay, like he's in. He's like Bruce. He's in the Bruce camp. He's a Bruce Davison, Bruce Greenwood. He's kind of in, in that in that <laughs> the, the Bruce the, the Bruce's. That's fine. That's fair. Yeah, but that's um. That's weird that that's where my mind went with Courtney Cox and uh, Bobby Donks went to that it didn't, different movie. It, it didn't go straight to the Dancing in the Dark? No. Bruce Springsteen music video? Uh, She's in that, too. She is in that, yes. Yeah. Uh, that sort of weirdly staged... Um, but I was just thinking, I was I was thinking, oh, we, we listen to that, to that album quite frequently, and I guess that's a... Um, that's where I am in the Springsteen patholo- uh, pantheon. I guess I don't. I don't dislike Springsteen, but I like his like most pop album. I guess mm, so. I don't yeah. know what, where that puts me, but I think that, that album is fantastic. Is that born in the USA? Yes. Yeah. On that. Yeah. Yep. Um. Yeah. So I don't know what that what that means about anything. But what, do you have any strong opinions opinions about Springsteen? I like him more than i think i do yeah um like i i've never really done a super deep dive on springsteen 
but I feel like anytime I hear a Springsteen song, I'm like, yeah, that's pretty good. Like I, I'm not a I'm not a hardcore. I no. know many people who are like very hardcore Springsteen fans. Yeah. Um, like his energy. That. Love his energy. He does oh, not, yeah. yeah. Play for five hours. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like, you know, Thunder Road, fantastic. Yep. Born in the USA, all that stuff. Uh, yep. Nebraska, good album. Yep. Greetings from Asbury Park. You know what I don't like? I will say on the record. Did you listen to his podcast with Obama that was on Spotify for three weeks or whatever it was? <laughs> Rebels. No, I, I can't imagine. Are you sure it wasn't just two people doing impressions? Because I feel like <laughs> it would have been, been better, I think. <clears throat> I will say on the record that I think the Manfred Mann version of Blinded by the Light is superior to the Bruce Springsteen version. Oh, okay. Uh, and I, most Bruce Springsteen people seem to think that that one's like objectively a better. It's not. <laughs> it's it's boring it's a boring song yeah from the period where bruce springsteen was just trying to be bob dylan gotcha yeah manfred man elevates it much better elevates the material just like mama Voyager. never told me not mama always told me not to look into the eyes of the sun but yep. mama that's where the fun is <laughs> you burn your the coronas greatest, the greatest breakdown in 70s music history right there uh what are we man, talking about man elevates Springsteen in the way that Voyager elevates the Borg is where there we're we going to go with this. We're in the Necrot Expanse, its conclusion. I don't even think that they ended the episode by saying we've cleared the Necrot Expanse. So I don't know if they're just never going to mention it again, but that might be a oh, Voyager wait. way of doing it. I thought things. we had one more. No, we're done. Oh, I thought you said this was three of four. No, it's three of three. You're just you're still oh. on the fact that you got oh, four man. right for Tom Paris. Yeah. I just I just want more. They gave us so much <laughs> that I even Enterprise <laughs> recognized that it hit the end of an, an expanse or whatever it was in, and it, it said it, but not Well, I, at least in this episode, they had the, the sense of mind to have one of the characters say, like, there's guys, there's literally nothing here. Yeah, this yeah. is, anyway. That's what, I, that's what I was going to reference when you were saying that there's unwritten tomes about the stuff. They, they got to the end and were just like, there's shit in this place. There's not, it's purple gas for some reason, and that's the expanse that we have mm -hmm. dealt with. So Unity, um, we have, uh, as we mentioned in the previous episode, jumping around has kind of like altered our perspective of the Borg, I think, because we've watched so many of the shows that came after and before Voyager, and now we we don't have like a chronological understanding of the Borg. Mm -hmm. But they're back here for the first time since Descent, it must be, right? I think that's the last TNG Borg episode, so this must be the, the first appearance. The Borg are back in town. One of the patrons has that coming up. I'm going to give you that one just because I don't know the verse structure of the melody well enough to sing that. So get okay. you better start Googling Boys Are Back in Town while I'm I talking. know that song pretty well. <laughs> hopefully, I can, hopefully I can do it off the cuff. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I don't know. Where do you want to start with this one? Um, did you generally I, like it or did you just want to talk about the Borg? I will say I generally did like it. And I think this is probably the most interesting thing I've seen them do with the Borg since the first Borg episode ever. Since even uh, after best, best of both. Of, oh, okay. So the next next to best of both worlds, I think this is probably the most interesting Borg episode I've seen. Okay. Have you seen? Did you? I can't remember if you watched I Borg in Descent with the original podcast. You might not have. I can't remember. Um, I let, well, let me let me put it this way. You like this episode, yeah. I like this episode. I think in the Borg stuff that I have seen in recent memory, yep. whether it's Enterprise or whatever they were doing on Picard or wherever else they show up, yep. I think this is – in, the, in the, the way we always talk about the Borg is that they get worse every time they show up because it requires more explanation and, you know, the mystery goes away and they get the, – there's powerful. not a lot of uh, – yeah, there's not a lot of – uh, return value on yeah. the Borg because they keep you know diluting it. I think this is a was a really interesting way to do something new with the Borg. Um, I <clears throat> I couldn't help but f I can't tell if there's something missing from this episode though. Yeah, I, th I think but, there is. Yeah, yeah, but like the general idea I thought was really good. Yeah. Um, but I I it's tough because as I was watching it, I, I felt my writer brain kind of kind of clicking in going like there's i don't really know how you get out of this without making them look like bad guys but you they clearly don't want to do that like they keep they keep uh i keep i kept waiting for like the twist or something yes and it just never came it's like okay they're clearly trying to establish that these people are not bad 
Yep. But they're not establishing anything else really. Yep. And so when they get to that bit at the end, it's I'm not really sure where we're supposed to be um, as far as far as uh, <clears throat> everything that's happened. But I did I did think that that last scene with Chakotay and Janeway was really good because mm-hmm. that, that 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 gave him a moment to kind of summarize say, say what the episode is yes, about. Yeah. It, yes, yeah. yeah, and I so I thought I thought it went out on a high point. It's funny because um, we I watched it late last night and so when me and amy were making dinner tonight i just put on on the ipad and i like had it running in the background to refresh myself about what was Mm -hmm. going on and amy kind of had the same point having not seen it she kept asking me like so these guys are bad right like i was like uh no like they're they're good and she's like you know it goes a little bit further into it she's like she's like they must be bad like the, the, she's like, what else is going on in this episode? And I was like, no, this, yeah. they're not bad. And so it, it ended up like it finishes and she's like, they really weren't bad. What a, what a strange thing. She had kind of the same reaction that you did to it. And I felt that way watching it yesterday uh, before we rewatched it, where I was like, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, antici- I'm, I'm, I was watching this episode thinking like, what is the switch going to be here? Yeah. And it never, ultimately the switch becomes, they do, a better version of what Picard season two did where they reactivate a cube. Yes. Yes. Yep. And, Mm -hmm. and that was okay. But even, even there I was like, I get this, this is interesting, but they don't know what to do with it. And then they just blow it up. Yeah. Then then they have it because they, yeah, they have to get rid of it somehow. So I, um, I guess large, I generally agree with you is that I, I think this episode is, is, is okay. And it's probably, it's a better idea than it is an episode really. Like I, I like what it's yes, trying to be I would say that, more yeah. than what they actually get out of it. Um, I think that they, I also like the Chakotay and Janeway thing at the end. I just, I feel that it's, it's doing what's kind of like a Voyager special at this point, which is that it's not willing to really talk about the interesting thing during the episode at all. Mm-hmm. And I know that they kind of do a little bit of lip service to the fact of like what this, you know, there's a danger to reactivating the cube basically. Right. But Voyager never really gets to this point of um, how the Borg act. Is it ethical or not ethical to like help them act that way? And I feel that that's the really interesting thing about it. And the, they should have done this much earlier. That should have been like a, a like a, a point of contention amongst everybody yes. about whether or not this is supposed to be done this way. Yeah. And just saving it to the end feels like it's kind of like, ah, you washed your hands of that and you didn't really want to have the characters talk about it at all. So I, I like it, but I feel like it's lacking and like it doesn't have that great Star Trek thing of being like, this is entirely compelling all the way through. And I like, like, I can't wait to see how this resolves itself. It never felt mm-hmm. that way to me. Yeah, I think the worst thing about it is the um, the warring factions element mm-hmm. because I think that, A, I think it takes up too much space that could be used to, like if instead of instead of having everybody at war, they had something like, you know, when we crash landed here, everybody got separated and we, we've had no way to find them, so we need to do this thing so we can bring everybody together, that kind of thing. Yeah. At least that, that gets it out of the way, right? You know, that bringing your community back together sure whatever it gets out of the way but then you've got this like it's really ham-fisted and kind of confusing exactly what this <clears throat> civil war is about um and the <laughs> the scene at the end when the when the quote when the bunker is quote unquote under attack yes was, but with uh, a battering ram with three guys not even battering ram. was it did they I thought it was like three guys just like slamming on the door with their fists it no was not, they, had, they had like a metal pole that they were running okay into the door. Right, well at yeah. least they had a weapon or yeah. something but it it was it was really bad it was it was not <laughs> and and I kept because you know this is Star Trek and we see this stuff all the time so I kept waiting for. You know, the, the usual Star Trek thing is, yeah, we've been fighting with these guys for 30 years and they really hate us and we don't really know why they hate us. And then it turns out, oh, it's because you've been harvesting their children. Sure. That's why yeah. they hate you, you know, but they never do that. And so it's just this weird kind of background element and five guys banging on a door is enough to convene the, you know, the, the Crystal Skull aliens to get Chakotay to turn the cube back on. It's like it's not very strong. Yeah, I think I think if they had made the focus of the issue discussing whether or not 
you could use this clearly um, dangerous technology for uh, benevolent purpose, that's far more interesting than than the other stuff. Yeah. And and would it, it would you know it would it would allow Chakotay to get into it a little bit more and you know get some more interesting conversations going and I don't know I it, it's I, I I do I think this is one of the better ones we've seen in a while but yeah. it still feels a little kind of enterprisey in that way where it's like they have something interesting on the table but they just kind of all shove it into the last couple of minutes yeah 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 agreed I do you think. Two-part question. Do you think that what happens here is basically a metaphorical description of how the Borg started? And if yes to that, should they have focused on that more? Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, Because I, I think the implication at the end when he says, how do you refuse that power, is basically them describing what happened to the Borg in their origin story. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good that's an interesting way to 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 read it. I mean, honestly, I think that would be that's a much more effective if you if you had to do a let's show the origin of the Borg, I think doing it this way is much more interesting than if they had just been like, "Okay, we're going to show you what the origin of the Borg was." Time like if travel. they give you Yeah. Yeah. If they give you enough information in this kind of setup where you can kind of extrapolate out, "Oh, yeah, okay, that's probably what happened before." Way more interesting. Way more interesting way to do an origin thing. Um, I don't know if that's explicitly what they're doing, but I, I do get that that's, yeah, they, they're probably implying that it is a, having the Borg involved in any anything is a slippery slope back to the collective. Yeah, yeah. It's like the, um, the well-intentioned technology, you know, because obviously the 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 conflict here is that in order to save themselves, they forcibly assimilate the other Borg on the planet back into the collective with them. Right. And, yeah. you know, Chicote bluntly says it like they didn't ask their permission to do that, which is, you know, the metaphor for assimilation. Um, and I, I find that I, I just find that idea interesting. And I, I think that because they don't focus on that, uh, like conflict enough, it comes across as I feel I feel like what the Borg do here is not like f- well thought out enough or something. Like so I, I don't know I don't feel that you see the badness of this decision well enough because it, you know, they basically they hijack Chicote's mind and Chicote goes onto the cube and he activates it and that causes the mm-hmm. whole planet to get realigned and reassimilated. And then the planet Borg just blow up the cube to stop the threat of the old Borg coming yeah. back. Yeah. And it feels a little bit easy to get out oh, of yeah, that. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And, yeah. and, and I don't feel like the Borg on the planet got a punishment from what they did. Like you don't see the fallout or anything. You don't see the, the you never met a faction of the Borg that did not want to be reassimilated. Right. And we're like fighting against it because Honestly, to me, it's not even clear that like the rival factions on the planet are all ex Borg. It's not like explicitly right. stated, you know. So it's right, it's yeah. it's hard. I spent half the time thinking that they were like the natives of the planet who were fighting against the Borg that had landed there or right. something. Yeah, yeah, that's what I that's what I mean. Like they they never. I kept expecting that turn, but it never came. Yeah, it just seemed yeah. to be like, oh yeah, they're part of us, but they but you know. Uh, I also kept expecting um, what's her name the the ensign or whoever that get that Kaplan. gets killed. Which weird detail that she's just dead. That I, I was I was very much <laughs> expecting her to show up as a Borg or something <laughs> right. later in the episode. And she gets was, hit with the same thing as she did. He just survived. Yeah, it, yeah. it was just very strange. They're like, oh yeah, no, she's dead, and then they just never <laughs> brought it up for the rest of the episode. <laughs> Chicote gets to be upset. Yeah, not not Kaplan. Although she got them lost like, in the Necrot Expanse, so she gets what she deserves. That's true. I they gotta stop. We've said it before. Why do they keep taking these shuttles out? Yeah, they just keep getting lost. <laughs> this one, this one is especially pathetic. They just they just get lost out there. Yeah, like they just they can't just find drive their way in a back. circle. Yeah. <laughs> so. uh, like the the other thing I was maybe expecting was there was no civil war, and they just it's one group that did. 
uh, jumped Chakotay, and that was just because the, they needed him, and that was just the the story they came up with was right. oh yeah, civil yeah. war. But they didn't do that either, because um, they have good intentions. There's no twist, as we right. mentioned. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, they have strange. good intentions that is never presented as anything other than that. Um, yeah, I feel like I feel like activating the cube plays into that or something. You know, at least like. Yeah. You know, Picard season two, it was season two, right? That they actually, or, or was that season one? Uh, that was season one, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think season it is one. season one. Yeah, because season two is the time travel season. Yeah, that's right. So it's season one. Um, you know, Picard season one totally botched the cube activation <laughs> sequence. Yeah. Uh, Voyager does it better. It's just, it does end with that lazy get out of jail free card of they just destroy the cube. Um, well, the thing I was, sorry, go ahead. Well, I think my my point around that is just that, and it, it ties into the Borg uh, as a larger thing. Do you did you like this idea of? So I, I was trying to think about uh, how to discuss this, right? So like now I'm in now I'm in a weird place where I kind of know how this season ends with the cliffhanger and what the next season starts with. Um, mm-hmm. And so knowing what I know about how that goes, this, the, what they chose to do here feels kind of strange to me um, in that were you, were you surprised that Voyager encountering a Borg for the first time is so non-destructive to Voyager? Right. Like they mm. they run into a cube that has basically broken down and like all the Borg are dead. So they can freely go onto the cube and look at it and things like that. Yeah. They meet these friendly Borg who are down below who have sort of shed the old collective thing, but they still have this connection between them all, but they don't have any bad intentions. And then when the Borg cube reactivates, Voyager just runs away and the cube explodes at that point. You know, like I'm mm-hmm. I guess I'm a little surprised that in your introduction of a big bad, which is Voyager sort of also giving up on its own storytelling, right? Like they're now just like, sorry, but the minor aside is like, they're also, um, Voyager is at, uh, in the midst of a very bad season. They are in Borg territory franchise, like canon wise, but mm-hmm. they have only now started to choose to reveal the Borg in their show as the show has become kind of like shitty at this point in the season. Yeah. So you're left with this uncomfortable feeling of like, it makes sense that they see the Borg where they are, but they, they, it does feel like it's like a, a ratings grab almost or like something to, yeah. to reinvigorate. But anyway, did you feel that like, should the, should the in first encounter of Voyager with the Borg feel as dangerous as the first time that the TNG crew ran into them, basically. You know, mm. like, not that they can just walk around and see them and get on a cube and everything like that. What, what did you think? Well, I did find it very peculiar that when Janeway's first reaction was, great, let's go on, let's all go to the cube and poke around, nobody was like, uh, what? <laughs> right, yeah. <clears throat> you know, like, I feel like there's some meat for discussion in there about whether or not they should even bother like is is it better for them to just not poke that potential hornet's nest yeah uh versus because i'm you know ver- versus going over there and possibly finding out some technological thing that might help you i can see easily see both sides of that argument yeah yeah easy to um, easy to understand but um you know i'm on the fence because I think I would have rather seen this than have them try to do some sort of uh, best of both worlds type Borg story right yep. now. Yeah. Um, I think this is more uh, a more inventive avenue into into the Borg, but I I know what you mean. Um, so I, my my question, I, I, I guess my. My question here is, and I'm ha- I'm happy to put my own thoughts as my own audio in this episode to like explain to the listeners like what I'm what I'm thinking about, or I can give you a, a very vague description of how the season cliffhanger works that you can understand. I assume the Borg come back. 
the Borg come back, but yeah. but there is a the Borg come back, but there is a threat to the Borg in the cliffhanger, okay. right? So structurally to me, it seems like what you're trying to do as you build towards this is that I feel that like in the context of this episode, you should probably show the Borg as extremely powerful. You know? I would say, why don't we table this until we get to that episode? Because I think it's very difficult to talk about without having seen, without knowing what's going to happen. Sure. And then I think in looking at it in retrospect, it might be easier to to parse out whether or not it was the right move. Sure. Okay. So the way that they do things here would be running the Voyager running into the, the Borg this way, I think feels more like it's a like a later Borg story that mm -hmm. kind of it doesn't really play to the the strength of what the show is setting up, which is that Voyager is like totally alone out there. And I, yeah. I feel like Voyager being alone running into a Borg cube and you would totally have to change this so that they can somehow get away from it or there's some explanation as to why they aren't pursued or something like that. But I mean, that works in the Borg ethos too of like if you're not a threat, they leave you alone kind of. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I feel like the story here that they chose to go with is very similar to Iborg and it's similar to the Descent story, but it doesn't suit what Voyager's conception is as a story, which is that I feel that there should be more fear and nervousness around running into something like this out there. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Um, I, I don't think it necessarily would need to be a different episode to do that. Cause I think there are things in the episode that they could lean into more. Yeah. Like, like I was saying, as far as going onto the, onto the cube. But I think, um, <clears throat> I think what's, what is, what is interesting about this is that, uh, being ha as someone watching this who wouldn't know what the finale the of the season is going to be yeah this doesn't feel like they're setting the borg up to be a returning thing it just feels like this is they're, they they decided to, to run do a into borg one. episode yeah. and they're doing a different take on the borg that doesn't necessarily lead into anything else gotcha um so in with that in mind I, it doesn't bother me that much, but I do think they they leave a lot of stuff on the table as far as what they could get out of it. Um, because you could, I guess, what's better here? So I, I guess it, it ultimately comes down to like the decision of this little planet collective of Borg and what they decide to do and how they decide to do it and how they choose to control people and assimilate them and control Chakotay and things like that. Mm -hmm. Is is the is the is the the shittier ending better? Right where <clears throat> you sort of see the Borg, maybe not the origin story, but like they reactivate the cube, right? And mm -hmm. the cube is just sufficiently damaged that it can't pursue Voyager or something like that. Like they get away from it, but the Borg cube is reactivated itself. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's more of the downside of, I, I guess I don't like the way that it ends with Chakotay just going like, well, I wonder if this could go bad in a couple months. You know, like sure. I, I feel like the badness is very obvious and that you should draw the conclusion about this uh, more directly, which would be reactivate the cube. The people on the planet side get reassimilated or something and we're all back at square one, but Voyager escapes knowing that the Borg are out there. And now the Borg know that Voyager is out there too. Yeah, I well, I think blowing up the cube kind of helps uh, avoid that because there's there's not really that much of an indication that whatever's going on on the planet has any link to the larger Borg collective. No, right? they want to separate. Yeah, they want to be a co-op or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think his speculation makes sense as much as it it, it would make sense for any episode like because because the thing is like when you, when you say this doesn't fit into what voyager is about it, it, technically you're right but unfortunately voyager at this point has just turned into tng yeah a, re a regular star trek show so like they, they they if if this wasn't a borg episode this would be totally in line with a ton of other episodes where they go to a planet there's something on the planet they deal with the thing and then they're like huh that was weird didn't yep. we all learn a lesson and they move on 
I, um, I guess my... So I, I guess my criticism of the episode is more coming from the fact that it's like it reminds me of strongly of uh, Tobias in Arrested Development. Where he's like, no, 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 these <laughs> couples convince themselves and it never works out. But it might work for us. Like that's yeah. kind of the <laughs> argument about what the the Borg on the planet are arguing here, right? They're like, let's and and they the the episode talks about it. I just feel like it doesn't give a very good argument. She's like, "Yeah, we know the Borg are terrible, but we're not going to do that anymore. We're just going to mind link, you know, and mm-hmm. be the Borg except not be terrible about it." And I I feel that that's um I'm not extremely convinced that there is an an ending to that where Chakotay is talking to Janeway and they don't think it's 99% likely that that's how things are going to go for this planet, you know? Right. And that's where I think the Borg activation of the cube comes in line because it's like that's the downside to it. And I, I think they could have set it up better in that like the activation of the mind meld is like a very last resort thing taken by the planet for some reason. Like they decide like we have no other option. This is what we have to do to get out of the situation that we're in. Yeah. And it backfires on them. Uh, but they don't do that. They kind of end happily and they're sort of off do- accomplishing what they want to accomplish. And I don't, I don't well, know if that works for me. Well, the thing I was confused by is I don't know why turning on whatever they turn on on the cube uh, continues to work even though the cube gets blown up. Yeah, I guess it just kicks up the connection a notch. It doesn't, it doesn't yeah, make a lot of I, sense. Yeah. My, I assumed it was like they wanted to essentially use the cube as like a satellite or something. Right. And yeah. so whatever they were doing required that part of the cube to be operational. I'd be fine with it, that too if the cube just blew up for some reason and they lost their link. Well, you know? I, I think the way you would go with it is you turn the thing on on the cube and then all the Borg start coming back to life and then the people on the planet realize that this was a mistake and they have to blow the cube up. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. uh, which is not what they do, but like they just blow the cube up and they're like, Hey, we did that for you guys. Thanks. All right. <laughs> see you later. <laughs> yeah. no, so they, there's they, no, no, no hard feelings or something was their final line. Yeah. yeah there's no, uh, uh, there's no consequences really to blowing up the cube or to turning it on. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing It's like, if you're, if you're going to do, both of those, then one of them has to have a consequence attached to it. One of the, um, one of the, and other- you could argue that the way that they do at the end of the episode, that the consequence might be further down the line. But yeah, you know, as far as storytelling goes, in the story you're currently telling, this is what you got. There needs to, there needs to be a cause and effect kind of thing. Yeah. Well, the reason I asked you at the start um, if you had seen Iborg or Descent is that I think both, and I don't think you did. Um, searching my memory, I don't. Quickly. I don't think that I did. I think I. I only. I think it was Trek I, about I, did Iborg, and I think Modi did Descent with me as a two parter. So I, I don't think you did. What? But if you, the reason I asked that is because Unity to me is basically the same story as those two episodes. Oh, so, interesting. So, okay. which is what struck me is like you thought it was. Um, one of the better ones. And I was like, oh, it's very reminiscent of those two, which is that after you get past the Borg as an unstoppable force, the only story that seems to ever work or be possible is what happens if you break out of the collective. Sure. You know, and that's what sure. both of those episodes are about in TNG. Sure. Did, um, yeah, I, okay. I, I, I mean, I did. Well, what I, I think that's, that's not surprising to this me. Is my, I mean, this is my favorite of those three. I, w- I would agree yeah. that this is better than both Descent and Iborg, but it's uh, it's it's just a, the repetition is what is like catching my eye. Sure. Yeah, I, I, it doesn't surprise me that that's the case. I mean, that's kind of what they were going for on Picard as well. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I think they found an interesting angle on it where it's 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 the. You know, it, it's like the 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 Puritans leaving England because they want religious freedom, but once they settle in New England, they kick out anybody who's not Christian. Yeah, you right. know, it's like that kind of thing, and they don't understand why that's maybe not the best way to do it. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's it's. I thought it was a good a good take. Did um, I was struck by I, one of the one of the reasons that I um. But I like this one is that I think it's uh, in reading on memory alpha. This is what their intention was. It's uh, they're they're keeping in line with the Borg are basically a totalitarian like communist regime. Uh, like and so in this one, they're 
you know, the, the Voyager is very 90s. It, like it's it's completely mm. based in the 90s in a very interesting way. Uh, but they're they're basically using this as an allegory for the fall of the Soviet Union, which after the Soviet Union fell, all of the like satellite countries that were under Soviet rule and didn't have the central authority of the Soviets anymore. Like yep. a lot of civil wars broke out in Africa and the third world and, you know, the, the Asian uh, countries and things like that. And so that's kind of what they're talking about here, which is that after you lose the link to the Borg, you have these little civil war things that no one can figure out who's in charge or what the best way to reconcile stuff is. And I like that. I like that metaphor because I, I think I agree with that take of the Borg. Like that, that seems to be the, the, the threat of the Borg is as much of their unstoppability as the fact that like you lose yourself in them as to whatever it is. There is no like individual left at the point that you become one and they become, they're basically dead people at that point. Right. So like my, my take on it was always like the body is just kind of a dead corpse really. And I know that they're going to get away from this and they have been getting away from it, from the frequency that you can save people from being Borg uh, essentially. Yeah. But yeah. My ideal version of it is that the body is basically just like a Mr. Potato Head that carries around all the gear that's it uses, right. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they they don't do that anymore. But what they do in this episode is they move even further away, which is that they add a little bit of uh, Michael Pillar's 90s woo-woo magic to it, which is just like <laughs> if we all think about it, we can heal your broken ribs, Chicote. And I, yeah, I didn't like I, that at all. I thought that was terrible. I thought it was just I, magic. I didn't, uh, yeah, I, I didn't immediately read it as the satellite communist country Yeah, because my first reading of it was, oh, it's an ex-Borg New Age commune? Yeah, yeah like, sure. It yeah. Felt like it felt like they it was wedged in between commercials for pure mood in this place. <laughs> but, uh, but, I, I, but I do agree that is the, the communist thing is – is uh is is very accurate and you know it's a good it's allegory just, they, it's, it's, it's it is it works for it yeah and just and very similar to how it worked in real life where you know all the people who used to be part of the soviet union were just walking around not knowing what not to knowing do with themselves to do, yeah. but as soon as you hand them a mickey mouse t-shirt and a whams <laughs> cassette tape <laughs> boom t- back to life put a toy phaser in their hand and they are star trek fans ready to jitter for life uh did you like the, I'm going to call it the increasing mysticism of the Borg, which is that in an attempt to, to figure out a way that you can tell a story about these fairly simple antagonists, you have to give them basically a magic power, which is that yeah. they can heal each other by talking to each other through their minds. I, I yeah, didn't like it. Weird. I thought it was a distraction from what they're actually sort of constructed as. Yeah, I you know I get it to a certain extent because like Chakotay needs an in an in for for this psychic link thing. Um, and what what on earth could there possibly what reason could there be for him to to say yes to this other than his life depends on it, right? right. Yeah. So I I can I I can understand it from a from a necessity point of view, but yeah, it's 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 strange to to. To be like, yeah, if we all think really hard at your ribs, you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. I I generally don't um, – it's a super abstract idea, right? Like the idea of mm-hmm. assimilation and being a part of a hive mind is much more of an abstract uh, something that you think about. It. And it's more like it, like it's an allegory or metaphor for the political nature of it, of that like totalitarian thing. But because it's a sci-fi show, they have to go more abstract and they make it this like literal mind meld thing. And while I understand that they have to do that as as part of this plot, portraying that on television is ex- extremely difficult, I think. Like, I, I don't walk away from this being convinced that Chakotay has learned that this is why being a Borg is so appealing. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think that the montage of, like, he sees an old man hugging a little girl and is like, this is exactly, this is the best part <laughs> of being a Borg. I, I, don't, I don't think it, it works very clearly, and I don't think... You know, it it kind of fits how shitty of a character Chicote is. Like, I just don't really understand why Chicote is so into this. In some ways, I do. In some ways, I don't. Like, I like the, I like well, the sex metaphor that he has with her, yeah. but I don't like the now I know everything and I because I know you all so well, everything's very good. It it doesn't super work for me. I mean, it kind of tracks with his own Native American yeah stuff that they've 
baggaged him with. Um, but yeah, it's. <clears throat> I, I wonder if there wasn't a better way to to do what they were trying to do without without going in that direction. Yeah, because I I like the general idea of the assimilation provides a kind of like control metaphor, or there, there's sure. a, there's a level of control that you get from the the assimilation of everybody, and they point that out. It's just I for Chicote, it was all good. You know, he's not, yeah. he, he doesn't have a takeaway going like, his takeaway is all, I can't believe how well I know everybody. This is fantastic. What a great time that was to be assimilated by the Borg. He doesn't have a moment of like, I couldn't leave until you let me leave, you know? Right. I, I, I just, I, I feel like there's more there. The, the episode felt weirdly not confrontational about what the central point was with it. And it, it didn't want... It didn't want there to be any kind of like argument between the characters until the very end, and it's not even an argument at that point. Yeah, that what that's the thing that remains very strange about the episode is that they don't really interrogate the concept, uh, and they really kind of go out of their way to make these people seem like they're completely on the up and up. And I, and I, and I do think <clears throat> maybe it's a symptom of the kind of stories that they they're used to telling. But I don't think that they have to be outwardly malicious mm -hmm. to interrogate the idea, right? right like they yeah. can still be as well intentioned as anybody else, but maybe not be considering what the negative aspects are or yeah. could be. Not seeing the forest for the trees, basically. Yeah. yeah, and they do. They tack it on at the end, but I think there's a much more interesting episode in there if they if they can really get into it and try to uh, defend and discuss yeah. their situation instead of just uh, kind of dragging it out. Can we talk about the biggest plot hole? Sure. When um, Chicote learns that she's a Borg... And Riley goes, I was I was assimilated at the Battle of Wolf 359. Um, because it's literally the only battle that ever existed <laughs> with the Borg in all of Star Trek history. Well, it's, it's certainly the only one that makes sense where humans would be assimilated. Right? That's true, yeah. And so he has this huge plot hole. Chicote does not say, how did you get back here so quickly? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take us 67 years. Right. You got yes. back here in three three years. How did that work out? Yeah, is there... I mean, I'll turn the ship on for that. Also, they you blew know? up the cube. Right. <laughs> oh, the cube that brought them there? Well, the cube that was at Wolf 359 got blown up. Oh, yes, that's true. Yeah, well, they could have been on one of those... Circle spherical, ships. <laughs> spherical ships that they pooped out at Earth in first contact. But no, that's a that's great a different, question. That's a different battle anyway, too, right? So unless they also well, call that Wolf 359. It doesn't mean that they don't have those ships oh, at, sure. at that battle I, as well. I got you. Know oh, I, mean? I see what you mean. Though she should have clarified that. Otherwise, I'll still stamp this plot hole right on top no, of it. No, it is. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, it is not a plot hole because it, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter. It, in, it doesn't affect the, <laughs> the actual plot. But it is a character inconsistency because when the concept, the base concept of your show and something they call out very specifically in this is that they're flying home and it's going to take them 67 years. He absolutely should have said, how did you get back here so fast? <laughs> he even like teed her up for it, too. He He's mentions like, it's the going timeline. to take yeah. 67 years in case unless, I don't know, there's a wormhole or something. Yeah, She's like, least. yeah, yeah, that's 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 crazy. <laughs> I just woke up here. It was an over. It was a red eye flight for me to get out here. I just woke up on this planet, and everything was. Everything that is was. true. I mean, it is. It is possible she has no idea. Yeah. Although, if she's part of the collective, she should. She know, should know. Right? She should know the yeah. origin of the Borg, and she should know exactly what route they took to get back there. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's just something I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, all right. So, are we done with this one? Did you have any other points? Um, um, I did. I don't know if they've done this before. Mm -hmm. But I thought the way that they introduced the cube was great. The uh, in what the, yeah, what sense? I need to be reminded. The shot of the you just see like the sliver of light on the right angle, oh, and then the cube yeah, starts yeah. to turn towards the. I thought that was really cool. I yeah. don't know if they've done that before, but no, um, I think it's new. I uh, I thought 
I thought uh, Bobby Dunks did a pretty good job with this one. I thought as it a looked director. good. Yeah. Hmm. I thought it looked pretty good. Um, you know, you can't really, there's no really good way to stage that final sequence, but. No, no. It, the, yeah, I think I think he did, I don't remember the direction of Sacred Ground because the episode was so shitty, but I, I thought he right, did a good yeah. job in this one. Um, I think it held together. I'm looking at the picture of the Borg in sickbay right now, and I'm just kind of wondering if I have anything to say about that. I don't really, I don't think. Um, that, that I did. I did like that scene because, like, even though they don't get into really how much fire they're playing with here, there is that certain, uh, you know, they they do kind of react as though a bat flew into their room. Yeah, when when the Borg turns on because the the doctor's just poking around in there, and then one <laughs> Borg, one Borg could fuck up the whole ship. Well, that that's the you know? I think that's the thing about it, right? So they're they're. They're going on and on about how all the Borg on the ship are dead. So we'll take one back, yeah. right? They reactivate it. It wakes up and starts like going haywire. So the doctor's like, oh, fuck. And he turns it off again and it falls down. <laughs> but they go, I think Kess says like, I thought you said he was dead. And the doctor goes, he is dead. And I, so I'm sitting there going like, does it matter if the Borg are dead? Really? Like right, they can just yeah. be reanimated. So I, I would feel, I feel like saying the Borg on that ship, on that cube are all dead will be perfectly safe is very meaningless of a statement with my yeah. understanding of the Borg. Especially at the end of the episode if all of those they come Borg back. wake up. Yeah. yeah. They're just it sleeping. Is, right. It is a it is a weird way to, to handle it. <laughs> but I did I've never thought of it before, but I do like my allegory that they're just a Mr. Potato head. <laughs> that <was. Yeah. laughs> That's that kind of is what they are. They could they should do things of like um uh I'm just writing my own Borg episode now. Like I could see Borg taking bits of themselves off and like sliding it under a door or something to get to the other mm. side, you know? That's but, fun. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think the thing that's the most frustrating with the Borg is still they they try to kind of go halfway with it in this episode by showing people who have implants still in their faces and are missing arms and stuff. But I think the biggest misstep is having – assimilation be something you can undo in yeah. like a weekend yes yeah you know like the the, the 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 first borg that you saw that didn't have a hand and just had like a weird spinny thing with a laser on it <laughs> yeah i i didn't think that was just like a glove he was wearing as they they right. put it on the way they put it on picard right where he just yeah, slides yeah. his hand in there yeah i thought oh they cut his fucking arm off <laughs> which is what they do in they, first contact they have that horror right. sequence yeah yeah. yeah, exactly. And so, like, when you come back from that and it's just like, oh, yeah, well, you know. Yeah. Lo- Locutus, Locutus got, like, the, the base level package or something, so I guess it was reversible, but it's... <laughs> well, same it, with I've Seven. I've always found that. Yeah. Seven, yeah. It's like... We, they, we they, turned, they all we did was we had to take off a couple a couple of these robotic prosthetics, and she went from gross zombie back into yeah. chesty blonde. Yeah, chesty blonde. They, they, the, the Borg have as much need for ample bosoms as uh, as humans do, I guess. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a... It is a strange choice, but, like... If you're trying to do something like this, you can't exactly have it be a horror show, you know. But yeah. it it does. I I have always found it to be one of those things where it's like, okay, if you can come back from being a Borg, maybe fine, but it should be a, a an Dramatic. ordeal. Yeah, yeah. Which I I think that yeah, at least the, with the um, the mental trauma they do with Picard, obviously in Seven, that's a large part of her character. But there True. is there yeah. is a yeah there. It's very fortunate that the two leads who were ex-Borg are not physically maimed at all by the process of becoming a Borg. Um, but I, I mean, because the maiming to me is very vital to what the metaphor for a Borg is, you know, which is right. that you just you right. lose yourself literally uh, to what they to what they need. Um, I imagine they had a conversation where they're like, should we give Locutus the full package? <laughs> no, we need someone who's camera ready so he can talk to the humans when we eventually take over. Yeah, it's they maybe, maybe that's why they just wanted to give a best foot forward and not cut off uh, Picard's leg or something. Um, all right, so I guess we're done with Unity. What about, what about the woman? Should we, you know, no, keep them. <laughs> But why? We don't. What do, what <laughs> what do, do we Borg, need them for? What do Borg need them for? 
Trust I, me, just keep them. <laughs> I want I want there to be an incredibly nerdy writer who's deep into like the lore of this stuff and thinks about it realistically, just talking to Berman about like why why the breasts on Seven of Nine don't make any sense. Trust me, I've thought about it and I have plenty of reasons why we should keep them. Thanks everybody for listening to our coverage In canon. of Unity which is our latest podcast that we covered this episode of Star Trek Voyager. You can the support one, the show. The one other thing I was going to I was going to bring up cuz it it did sure. pop into my head. Um if you were on this planet, say get rid of the Borg stuff. If you were just a human on this planet, right? Yeah. And then Chicote and Voyager showed up and he's like, "Do you want to come back?" Would you go back or would you be like, eh, nah, we kind of got a thing going on here. We're just going to stay, even though we're in the middle of a civil war and it kind of sucks. They didn't They didn't have a paradise planet. I would have left. I'm surprised yeah. that none of them wanted to go home. I was, I was on the fence, honestly, because part of me, 100%, it's not like it's a, it's not like it's paradise. But on the other hand, it's 67 years on a starship. Yeah. I don't know. You kind of used to, you're living outside. Yeah. You're used to it. Do you really want to go on sick just to die on a spaceship? You know? So I, I don't know. I, I feel that's something that the episode could have gotten into, which would have strengthened the, 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 like, um, uh, the unity in assimilation, right? Like them not wanting to leave is because the assimilation has like changed their minds so much that sure. they can't live without each other or something like that. But sure. Th at a certain point, there's too much in the episode itself to really, you, you can't fan out too much because you end up with six episodes. Uh, Patreon.com slash the Penske file is the best way to support the show. If you do, you get to leave comments about upcoming episodes like the ones we're about to read. This first one, Clay, is from Kyle mm. Barrett, longtime listener, faithful listener, faithful patron, Kyle Barrett, who talks about Unity. I guess the show making it to the second half of its third season before introducing the Borg is admirable, and it's a delight to have a Voyager Borg story which feels somewhat fresh before they become increasingly trite. This is the beginning of the series, making it incredibly easy to stop being a Borg, but I do like the idea of the cooperative here with the story putting the similar yet stupider idea in Picard Season 2 to shame. Right, okay. That he, he is right. I, yeah, I, so I, you, I you, were, yes. you corrected me. I think I was confusing the cooperative, which is in Season 2, with the yes. cube activation in Season 1. I do think the key drama and debate is The Borg were in to, all Picard seasons. Yes. <laughs> After famously, <laughs> never, never famously, I, he, hard Patrick line. Stewart said, "I don't want Borg into anything." <laughs> the anything only anymore. thing I agreed to to do this was I said, "No Borg. We've done the Borg. There can't be any more." Patrick, we hear you. Well, how about this? <laughs> She's got no. You boobs. give you <laughs> give us the Borg. You give us the Borg. We'll give you a sexy Irish Romulan. <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> Do we get to, you know? <laughs> mm. Sure. Sure. That makes sense. <laughs> You'll get a writer credit. I do think the key drama and debate is introduced too late, however, and Chakotay continues to feel undefined and inconsistent. The idea of all these races stuck on a planet forced to cohabitate, so, sorry, first to cohabit and build a community Deadwood style would be a cool premise for a new series looking at all the same classic Star Trek themes in a micro way rather than macro. Three bald caps out of five. I it's saw kind of what it's more. It's kind of like what Deep Space Nine is, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's uh, that's a good point. True point. I um I saw a review saying that the Borg are actually a criticism of capitalism. And I'm only saying this because uh, uh, Kyle brought up Deadwood here. Hearst is a much better examination of raw capitalism, right? Which is that it's like, I, I just, I, I feel like it's a kind of a popular thing to do this and to say that this, this is like a capitalist thing, but it, it doesn't make any sense because it's, it's a bunch of people driven by one thing rather than a like a free marketplace of like each trying to get their own best out of it, you know, which is what Hearst represents, yeah. you know? Yeah, I, at the same time, though, I can kind of, I, I don't think that the Borg are common on capitalism, but... Is it just the consumption aspect? I guess, because, I mean, technically, I think you could, if you wanted to, despite it being pretty, the text of the show being that Hearst is a extreme capitalist, Yeah, 
he is kind of similar to the Borg in a certain extent that he floats into town and just assimilates everything around him in, in service of, of one goal. Mm. Um, so I guess you could, if you want to look at the, if you want to look at the Borg as like a large corporation or something yep. that is just, it's just absorbing sucking up, at that point. Absor- absorbing smaller companies and, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, mm. I, I think it's, Philosophically, no, I, 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 I can see that point. I think philosophically yeah. it doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, just that. They never lay anybody off in the Borg. That's true. Yeah, it's, it's hard. To, <laughs> there's no severance. There, there's a sever package that you get when you yes. sign up, but there's not a severance when you leave. Uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I think that the, like her still, there's a, it fundamentally comes down to you lose your own decision making in the Borg. Like that's the, that's sure. the key thing. And I think that, you know, Hearst is at least, Hearst is an individual doing something where the Borg is this collective idea of like everyone subjugates to it and is kind of like willingly a part of it. And right. I, think, yeah. I guess that's the difference. I just, I mean, I find it kind of a clunky thing to say that the, the Borg represents some kind of capitalist influence. Everybody working for Hearst is still getting paid, you know? The yes. Borg ain't getting paid. Right. And there's a, the reason that they would, yeah, align with Hearst is because they have their own self interests that are driving right. them in that way. So, yeah. yeah. That, I just thought it was I think, a strange metaphor. Yeah. I think it's a symptom of, is that a recent? article it was yeah and yeah, and I, I think it's a, a symptom of modern sense online criticism where you can make the case for literally anything yeah yeah in the age of uh, like i could consumerism i could say i would i would sure. buy that more like yes there's a consumerism aspect i could yeah that's that's what dawn of the dead is about yeah so put the borg in that you got a a plus movie night of the living dead was about red scare communism same creatures used 10 years later for uh, consumerism. <laughs> Do a lot of things. A lot of things. Doesn't have to be one thing. Tax Bear says, Unity, one more Voyager does a less dumb version of a later Picard concept. Good episode concept, though this does devalue the idea of becoming a Borg. Of, of, of becoming a Borg being a... Oh, it does devalue the idea of becoming a Borg being a point of almost no return. That's true. Kensito says, Unity, I've seen this episode get a lot of criticism from fans for not being a more traditional Borg episode, and I think that works to its advantage, or but I think that works to its advantage, and was a smart way to bring the Borg into Voyager. The few seconds at the end when the Borg queue begins to reactivate gets the blood pumping and sets the stage nicely for what's coming. Four out of five. I think my my annoyance with the Borg ship getting blown up at the end is I'm like, can I get one Borg cube reactivates and fuck shit up for a little bit? Like, I, right, I, I think yeah. I'm just begging for that. I, I guess it's a power. Why thing. didn't they? Uh, why didn't they just use that giant airlock that they use in Picard? Right, sucks them all out. Sucks, the space. doors just open and they all get out. The Picard one is more egregious. Not to go back to that, but <laughs> they they could have had the Borg be a horrible force that destroys the enemy. Right, like because the the wrong oh, yeah. ones were the ones on the on the the ship. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Then they yeah, could have just fucked show. off. Bad show. Yeah, that was a bad show. Uh, the Condal. These are quick, so I'll read them. The Condal says, R.I.P. Ensign Kaplan. Best part. It was kind of creepy the way they revealed the dead Borg vessel, and I liked the writers placing Tuvok in some scary moments on the ship. Interesting ideas, but it seemed to fall a little bit flat. Three neurotransmitters out of five. Yeah. I was so I was legitimately surprised when Chicote just straight up blasted Tuvok. Yes. Yeah. It's it, it, a lot of uh, guns not doing anything. Chico take a shot, and he still manages to accomplish what he needs to accomplish. He gets think. shot twice yeah. in this episode. He's a he's a fucking hero. This is Patrick Siebel with Unity. <laughs> I've tried now three times to get through this Drek through depth to the Borg, though depth to the Borg. Good idea, Star Trek. This review, it's quite wan. I'm bored with Beltran. <laughs> Wake me with a drone whose suit shouts here to feck. <laughs> That's right. Two stoically bitchy Tuvok line <laughs> readings out of five. <laughs> big other big plot hole. They have characters who pronounce the word B U O Y differently in the show. And this is a, a real modern pet peeve of mine, but I cannot stand people who say buoy for whatever reason. It's boy. You say boy. And I think Chicote says boy. What? And Tuvok says buoy. I have never heard anybody say pronounce that word boy. Yeah, it's boy. It's boy. That's how you pronounce it. 
Do you say buoyancy? Buoyancy. I, I've never <laughs> thought about it. <laughs> I a, don't live much of a seafaring <laughs> life. <laughs> well, let's sing some shanties and drink some ale clay the next time we're together, and I'll, I'll show you the way. But they mix it up. Someone says buoy, and I say boy. And boy, am I correct. Let's move on to Norman Buckwell. Did you just read that one? You did. Norman Buckwell says, Unity, fans complained about this episode that it was not exciting, but it was quite cerebral and thought-provoking. The cooperative may be the best insight we'll ever get as to how the Borg likely came into being. Chakotay's telepathic surgery and sequence of images were awe-inspiring. If there was any continuation I'd like, maybe from Prodigy, Legacy, Lower Decks, is any continuation of Riley Frazier and her group. Although whoever put in that line, Happy Hunting Grounds, shows the writers collectively still go for the stereotypes of the indigenous. For I don't even remember that line. Who says that to oh, Chakotay? Yeah. yeah, he says that uh, when she's trying to sell him on fixing him. Oh. He says, like, it's either that or the Happy Hunting Grounds. Off to the Happy Hunting Grounds. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Four cortical surgical pieces out of I, five. I I'm, I only looked this up because that I had never experienced that before, but it, according to the Oxford Dictionary, mm-hmm. the pronunciation is buoy. No, it's boy. It's boy. I I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> boy or buoy. If you've grown up in the USA, you may be wondering why we're discussing these. After all, boy is pronounced around with toy, while buoy is pronounced buoy, so they don't sound alike. However, in other English dialects, such as British and Australian, boy and boy are homophones. Yeah. It's just, it's the old original way to say it. Huh. Well, all right. Learn something new every day. So let's, any any foreign listeners, uh, let us know if people saying buoy drives you insane, like it does for me. I mean, it's going to be confusing. It, if, people will be much more anxiously looking in the water if you say, look at that boy in the water. Yes. Yeah, if you're saying, oh, could somebody please throw three boys into the water? <laughs> e- There's going to be a lot of questions. <laughs> I've got my hand stuck in a boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just floating around. I got my, I've got my arm through this boy hole. Um. <laughs> you got to pay the troll toll. You, that. <laughs> you do. All right, here is, did I just send you one? No, here's uh, yeah, Jaron yeah, Hatch. Yeah. Or you didn't read this one, right? Yeah. No, I haven't read this one yet. It's fine enough, which isn't exactly the vibe you want to go for when you're reintroducing the big bads of the franchise. The idea of former Borg forming a community is ripe for thematic exploration, but it really needs a TNG or DS9 level show behind it to flesh it out. As it is, Voyager does what it does best. Get in, shoot your shot, and then get out as fast as you can. Pass the fuck out and forget the whole thing ever happened. Three sums that would out. Three threesomes sums that would out of this. Oh boy! Uh, three <laughs> sums that would out of this world out of five. I don't. I think uh, there's some word missing. There, in there might be a word. I don't remember any be? potential three sums. Three sums that would be out of this world, out of five. I don't know. Jaron, let us know. You gotta. You, you really need to put a boy in there. To, <laughs> <laughs> and Slope again, no together. one says buoyancy. So we'll keep moving on here. Garoppolo John Zorn. Well, nobody says ger- nobody says giraffe, but everybody seems very dead set that it's Jif. What do you say? I, 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 say, say, I say GIF. GIF. I say GIF. I say GIF. For the, we're talking about the moving image. Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. You call it a GIF? Yeah. What do you call the peanut butter that's spelled J-I-F? Gif? Jif. <laughs> why would why would you say there's no, there's no such thing as a hard J. <laughs> Unless it's from behind the paint. And then that's a very hard that's J. Not- <laughs> Depending if you especially if you're shooting over if you- Bill Lambeer. <laughs> if someone hits your elbow, it becomes a hard J, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the twenty five point bucket in rock and jock basketball, that was a hard J. Yep. Yep. The, <laughs> but once you get the little, once you become on fire, every J becomes a little bit softer. Grappler John Zorn says, Unity, in spite of its flaws, this episode is nothing if not thought provoking about collectives and free will and violence and intimacy. However, can we really say it's a Chicote episode if literally any other character would have made a more interesting linchpin for the plot? 
Just as they don't realize the writing Janeway is dangerously imbalanced from episode to episode, the writer's room doesn't realize that they've managed to write the once salty rebel leader Chakotay as a lovey-dovey loyal and naive milk toast. Just as TNG's Worf got his ass kicked so often it was hard to think of him as a badass, Chakotay, as written, deserves none of the respect that the crew affords him. While the final scene in Janeway's ready room works well enough for the episode, it's an eye roller that neither Janeway nor Chakotay seem to recall that he pretty much gets fooled by everybody. A generous <laughs> three out of five as a standalone, but another one out of five for serialization without coordination. Well, but he doesn't get fooled, though. Like, even in that dis- discussion they're having at the end, it's not like they pulled one over on him. No, they, I you mean, know, they, they, they use still, him. Yeah, yeah. They use him, yeah. but they don't fool him. Like, the, the thing that they're doing isn't for something other than what they claimed it would be for, you know? That's true. Yeah. I'm just thinking back to how Chakotay handles this. I mean, well, I guess they do put his, his life in death is the reason that he's doing it. I... I I, I think Chakotay's characterization works the way that the show's characterization works is that he he does not really interrogate these things enough, you, you know, for it to feel like yeah. it's like a a defensible act that he has to take or because um, he does choose to go through with the assimilation type thing. So he does. It is the kind of thing where it's like you met a girl at Burning Man and now all of a sudden yeah. you don't wear shoes anymore. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Sure. And yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden you've got gross dreadlocks that you probably shouldn't have <laughs> you're doing something else with that jay cerulio <laughs> i'll send this one to you this one's uh cerulio and i'm sending it right now unity isn't a great episode to actually watch but it's one of my favorite episodes to think about i didn't see this episode until i was an adult having bailed on voyager during the second season and not come back until the last few minutes of The Gift in the fourth season. I mentioned that because I spent years thinking about how the Borg got started, discussing with friends who were casual fans, but then I saw this and it was very close to my headcanon. I really like that they show how enjoyable being part of a collective is until they start overriding Chakotay's will, because that sense of connectedness is probably how the Borg started. Some space Elon started putting chips in people's heads to connect them to space Twitter, and the whole thing got out of hand. Yeah. Three lonely Borg out of five. I didn't mention I I like this as a Borg origin story. I, yeah, I, yeah, um, I do too. I agree with you that I'm glad they didn't just go back in time and watch the first baby Borg get like a chip stuck in his head, and it's right, much more yeah. uh, allegorical than that. But I I think this is a pretty good idea of this is potentially how the Borg started. I really wish that they just, they paid more attention to the conflict about whether or not this is a good idea to do uh, in the first place. Yeah. Uh, Next person is, sorry, let me click the button. Changeling. Oh, it's yours. It's got the (laughs) the song. Here we go. Go. The Borg are back in town. The Borg are back in town. Uh, We're going to show the trying to see if... (laughs) Okay. Okay, I think I got it. Go. <clears throat> when a shuttlecraft goes astray, we get a love interest for Chakotay. Uh, that's all I got. I can't, I can't do it for that. It's an okay episode, and I don't have much to say. That's why I made the song for Wes and Clay. Three Al Pacinos <laughs> finishing, these three, finishing three seasons of Picard where the Borg are the main antagonist watching Voyager and saying, just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in out of five. I can hear it in my head, but I cannot sing it. To say, I don't know. That's weird. I have to go listen to the song now. I can I can hear it in my mind, but I can't put it to the tone. Of the well, song. the problem is that that it's uh, the song isn't. It's it's three rhymes and then a non rhyme mm-hmm. for that first verse, so it's a little bit difficult because he does for the four rhymes. Oh, uh, so poor, it throws you off. Poor bit. writing. Matt yeah. Ross says, Unity, a concept, Good attempt. a concept done better here than in TNG's Descent. What happens when the Borg lose their collective and revert to old prejudices and have scarcity? The concept here is interesting about how some are trying to rebuild and live in the terror of the lost Borg cube as its crew is getting closer to the, uh, close to its worst enemy. Chakotay getting some action also kind of implies it was a group thing. It's a hell of an ask to reactivate a piece of a cube, but not unreasonable until they just kind of take over Chakotay again. Makes you wonder how benevolent the mini collective actually will be, and I wish there was more. Three Unimatrixes out of five. Point Extra G says, Riley is a true Texan. She, in- invent- 
she inserts blue bonnets and BBQ into conversations completely unprompted. I'm surprised that she didn't bring up Bluebell, Willie Nelson, Dr. Pepper, Matthew McConaughey, and the Alamo. This episode is really about the human tendency to miss and desire what used to be in your life, even when that thing wasn't really a positive. I could see Exborg longing to be reconnected to some sort of collective mind because they no longer know how to live without it. This makes you wonder if the Borg originated in a group trying to create a cooperative like you saw in the episode. There's a, there's a good domestic abuse metaphor for the Borg here that oh, they, sure. they don't do. Yeah. Yeah. How they're all, how all abusive partners are extreme capitalists. Yeah. And how, you know, the, the <laughs> cooperative people are asking for it and they should yeah, just, you know, exactly. yeah, yeah, they shouldn't, you know, you got to expect what you're, what you, you always got to have the last word. <laughs> uh, me and Amy watched that, uh, that famous Sean Connery and Barbara Walters. Oh, thing. yeah. <laughs> Every now and then you just got to hit a woman. He's like, you've always got to have she's always got to have the last word <laughs> oh boy boy oh boy notorious it is true i don't write condone hitting them but they always do have to have the last word <laughs> did i just read artorius uh no so i'm going to send this to you do, 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 i've do. just been pl- i've just been trying to make the song work in my head i know it's <laughs> Unity. Now here they all are in one place, a generation lost in space. While well, Cassidy read a book on Mars. This okay. sounds more like another, boys are we back got in another, town. F- <laughs> we got another. No, this is this is uh, American Pie. Oh, okay. Now, now, oh, Jesus. Okay. Uh, now here they are all in one place, a generation lost in space. While well, Cassidy read a book on Mark, she forced Chakotay to change everyone's hearts. The day the decisions <laughs> died. Okay. Yikes, guys. <laughs> Jeez, keeps going. <laughs> Do you believe in Mao and Marx that communism will save all from the start? Because manifestos why, tell why, you so. Why is it Kim be nimble, time? Kim be quick. Kim shoot better with that phaser stick. Forced conversion is a tyrant's only friend. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blending the songs now. As the captain, forced forced conversion is a tyrant's only friend. <laughs> As the captain saw the dis- saw the display, her hands were clenched in fists of her. That doesn't even rhyme. Oh, no des- <laughs> despotism <laughs> born from hell could ever bring forth anything well. Uh. <laughs> Three decisions that went dark out of five with a divine spark. <laughs> nice to- You didn't even finish the. Come on, man! Good, you gotta, if you're gonna do that, you gotta go all the way. Good effort. I don't understand why American Pie, but I I, pre- I appreciate you recognizing that. I spent half of it thinking like, is it actually rhyming or not? But it, it clearly was. Royo says, "Unity. If you insert yourself back into 1996, oh boy, Borg mania was at its zenith after first contact. That's true. We never. Um, that would be that would have been the advantage of watching the podcast all in a row. Like we we would have remembered the first contact just happened. You know. Mm. Uh, this episode unfortunately tried to do something different with the Borg and it spectacularly failed to capitalize on it. They don't even use the discovery of the Borg cube in the intro. Uh, let's pause here. Mm. Why can these shows not write cold opens anymore? Like I know it's very, we've talked about that before. Like once it gets to enterprise, it's just enterprise is a complete joke and Voyager yeah. Voyager frequently does not set up the plot in the, the teaser for some reason i i was thinking about that on this one especially because because when they revo- reveal the board cube it's so cool i was trying to s- decide whether or not they should have done that in the cold open and i'm not sure because i i did really like the reveal that the co- the that the commune were all former borg and i think if you tip the borg hand too quickly that's you lose the 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 uh the the twist of that okay um i was thinking you revealed in the, like when he gets captured in the opening the people who knock him out and capture him are have borg implants you know like i because i yeah i'm not sure what's really gained by hiding the cooperative from him for that yeah. little bit well i think i think that that the core of that is what we were talking about how they they they're just padding it with stuff that's unnecessary and don't get to the, yeah. the story point. Yeah. I think if you were going to get to the story faster, then yes, I would do it right away. 
but given the way this episode plays out, I don't mind it because I, I, I think it's an interesting twist, but I think it would probably be better served as just an establishing thing and not, not a twist. Yeah. Because, like, isn't I, you could argue that the twist isn't – you could play it that the twist isn't all these normal people are actually Borg, but that all these Borg are normal people. Right. So if, yeah. you, if you lead with the fact, oh, shit, it's the Borg, and then they're like, nah, man, my name's Jerry. Right. It's like, yeah. oh, okay. Hey, Jerry. <laughs> what happened to the teaser? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's um, – boy, they don't, I, the, these, these shows post-DS9 just don't respect the teaser, I don't think. And it's, it's, a, mm. it's a cool thing to have in a show. It's like – it's such a, a neat way to set up people to go like, oh, I, I want to know what this is and about. Like, even even if you're not if you're not setting up like the the plot directly, the best teasers are the ones. And I've said this a million times. The best teasers are the ones that have something to do thematically with the rest of the right. show. Yeah, it's like and a little this one's just or something. Yeah, this one's just Chakotay turn into the sense and going four left turns is a circle. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you mean we've taken four left turns? It's all right, Kaplan. Let's go down to this planet and figure out what's going on. Yeah. No. Totally agreed. Uh, looking back, it's appreciated that they had the balls to do something different as New Trek has made the Borg simplistic, trite, and tiresome. Don't be, get, get me started on the Borg or just lonely crap. What's interesting about this episode is that we get an idea of how the Borg may have gotten started without explicitly giving them an origin story. The subtlety is appreciated. I'm noticing, however, a blandness to the direction of the episodes. It seems like a dead Borg vessel where everyone died suddenly five years ago should be far more eerie like visiting the dead Reaper in Mass Effect 2, and a discussion that the Borg were perhaps defeated by a more powerful entity should have been a more terrifying thought, uh, should have been a more terrifying thought. In some ways, this episode takes more after Star Trek VI, dealing with the breakup of the Soviet Union and what it means for the former citizens in this brave new world. Four out of five. Still give it a four out of five. Uh, Samuel S. says, I understand that this episode is supposed to show the ex-drones in a morally ambiguous position, but to me, the whole lot of them seem clearly evil, and the fact that the show doesn't recognize this really bothers me. Samuel's just going to, yeah, going to be um, explicit about it. The ex-drones are duplicitous throughout the episode, and while they talk about respecting individuality, all they want to do is assimilate their enemies and take control of whatever they need to impose their will. In no situation should Voyager have just flown away to leave that group unchecked. A couple of torpedoes from orbit were required here. Two out of five obvious bald caps. I mean, I can't disagree with Samuel that um, they are much more sinister than the show seems to want to say that they are, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about that. I was trying to decide if I agreed with that. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I do. I mean, I don't know because they like they're not they're not lying. They're right? not. No, I mean, so I mean, they're what they their ultimate uh, use of the power, I guess, is less than ideal. Well, he's but, he's right that they are duplicitous, right? Like, so the the nonsense narrative stuff at the start, she lies for no particular reason about what they are, right? She does. They, well, they don't tell Chicote that he still has this mind control capability, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would, I would argue, it would make sense to lie to him about this up front, because it's quite a big move if you're trying to garner. If you if you're trying to not have a Starfleet officer freak the fuck out when they wake up, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably better to be, to not be like, hey, guess what? Everybody here is a Borg. Yeah. Um, the mind thing, yes that that's the most duplicitous thing that they do. I think is is leave that uh, fail safe in there without telling him. Yeah. Yeah. Jonah says Unity. Even though this was not a good episode. Even oh sorry even this even if this were not a good episode which it is it would be well received having followed a series of bad ones culminating in that abortion that we call blood fever at long last a three out of five and then unity how uh, the undiscovered Mugato how but more importantly why does that lady have such a nice wig she goes he's stumbling into her <laughs> without without her hair had a real <laughs> RoboCop feel to it. Murphy, but my biggest question is, how do they know that the hive mind signal doesn't stop once they blow up the cube? Isn't that what basically happened the first time? Three Girati style right. Borgtopias out. That's out that's five. the one of the biggest things I think that they don't talk about. Do they bring that up at all? Because I because that was my first thought was like, isn't turning this thing on just like 
throwing a couple boys into the ocean <laughs> and just letting them see see if they if they float. They should, yeah. I mean, it's like it's it's it's, 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 it, it's it should be once the cube turns on, shouldn't it be like a, a beacon for the other Borg? It should be, yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean. He, he Magado brings up the point that we never really made explicit. It's like this: the the ship powering down in the first place is what caused them to lose their connection to each other. And so, I didn't see a machine that they had on the surface that they were, maybe that's what they were building. They were doing something down there, mm. so maybe they were building some kind of system that can boot up or something. I don't know. Good questions. Thanks, patrons. I think the patrons gave. I think ninety percent of them gave it a three out of five. Uh, that's it. There's not another one that's like written to sound like Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah or anything? No, there's no um, Raining Blood version or anything yeah. like that. Full We Didn't Start the Fire verse. I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly interested to learn why uh, American Pie... I mean, Boys Are Back yeah. in Town is also an equally uh, an equally odd crab, but yeah, American Pie just struck me for some reason. It tickled me. Tickled well, me it's, silly. you know, Borg, depending on what country you're in sounds like something you'd throw in the water to help a guide a ship in. So, I mean, it's a, it rhymes. It's makes sense. This, what this, it's what the Swedish chef says endlessly. Is the board, the yeah. board, the board, the board. Have you heard the fallout boy cover slash update of uh, we didn't start the fire? No. Is that new? It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty bad. I'm sure. It's it is. Uh, remember how like, did they update one of the it? Hallmarks. Yeah. It's all, it's, it's from 1989 to 2023. Great. And uh, remember how, like, one of the hallmarks of that song was the fact that everything he said was in chronological order? Yes. This is not? Not anymore. Uh, no. That's half the work. Yeah, I know. And half the stuff that they put in there is is garbage. It's stuff that it's... <laughs> you should listen to it. It's bad. I'll give it a listen. I watched that... Um, what's that comedian show on Netflix? You told me to watch the Mimi thing. He's got the shirts with crazy colors or whatever. The sketch comedy oh, show. Uh, I think you should. I think you should leave. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I watched that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not a fan. Well, I I think it's one of those things. If I forced myself to watch a lot of it, I think I'd get yeah. into it. I yeah. I watch it. I kind of get annoyed, and I'm like, this guy has a stupid face. <laughs> like, that's my. That's- See, I I had the same reaction the first time I watched that show, but like, there's there's gonna be one that just clicks with you and then or then maybe not it. maybe not at all yeah but like there's there was one that clicked and i was like oh okay i get this now I'm not saying that you don't get it but like i i didn't i didn't really like it right bef- the first time i saw it but then one of the skits like just hit that sweet spot and i was like oh, okay yeah i, I feel right, like it got me i feel like there's something to unlock because the energy of all the sketches is the same so like it is once you yes. get that i feel like you'll yeah. get it but um it didn't sink in to me at all you should watch the one. Um, I don't know how many you watched, but the one where uh, it's it's supposed to be like all those scenes in movies, like a Johnny Cash movie, where they're trying to record the gospel song, mm-hmm. and then they're like, "Ah, this just isn't what the kids want." And he's like, "Well, I got something else for you." And then he starts playing like a really hard edge country rock song. Yep, no, I didn't and see that he, one. The guy turns to his band and says, "Just follow me. We're in B flat or whatever." <laughs> yeah. So he starts he starts singing the song about uh, the church bells ringing and getting shot down by an outlaw, and then the bass player jumps in to inter- improvise with him yep. and starts singing about how that day was also the day that the skeletons came to life. <laughs> yeah, that's that, that, that is the energy of uh, of the show that I've, I've yeah. seen so far. Yep. Uh, Patreon.com slash the Penske file if you want to support the show, if you guys want to support these incredibly long episodes like the one that we just recorded. So, Clay, patrons gave mm. us a three out of five. What are you going to give it? Uh, I don't know if I'm blinded by the oh boy. dull dull light of the previous half of the season. <laughs> Wrapped up like a deuce. Yeah. Another disappointed Star Trek fan. That I, I'm going to give this a four. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I'll give it a three. I, I, I think I... Um, I, I certainly liked it a lot more than a lot of the more recent episodes that we've seen. Um, I I think it's 
I really, it's just this Voyager. Voyager doesn't want to talk about its concepts at all, mm. and it's kind of frustrating. Well, you know, it's I, it's I'm giving this a four based on pretty much entirely on the concept. Yeah, because without the concept, it's a pretty standard three. Yes, at best, you know. Yeah, it's not. It's not a really inventive episode. No, except for that singular concept. Whereas, like. I don't remember if I gave this one a good review or not, mm. but the one with Michael McKeon where she goes into the program and it's... Oh, no, you were down on that one. Was I? Well, yeah. regardless, that's like a different episode at least. Yeah, sure. You know, but this is this is a good concept tacked on to a pretty standard episode. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll give it a three just to even out our enthusiasm for it. But I, I did enjoy... It kept my attention in a way that a lot of the recent ones have not kept my attention. And... um I guess bringing in the Borg accomplished what they wanted to do there. So we'll see how things continue. The next episode is Darkling. So we will move into that. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you for supporting the show. Patreon.com slash Lepenskevel. Join the Discord, all that stuff. There's links in the podcast. Clay, do you have anything you want to say before we go? Um, check out Rotten Horror Picture Show on Patreon. Uh, we're doing video nasties this year. In July, we did Bay of Blood. In August, we are doing uh, Toby Hooper's The Fun House. And uh, Badass is still going. We're one episode away from finishing season two of Batman Beyond on Badass, which I think uh, after that we'll be doing Return of the Joker, which I think will be a good one. Uh, it's basically the only reason to watch Batman Beyond, I'm kind of finding out. Mm-hmm. but uh, And I've got a comic book on the stands called Batman White Knight presents generation joker number three is out right now number four comes out in a couple weeks i think so check it out are you almost done with batman beyond we have one more season okay and it's a short season it's only 13 episodes so it'll be uh seven episodes from us yeah i think you guys are not to uh not to make assumptions it sounds like you guys enthusiasm for the beyond stuff is wearing thin uh judging by the amount of content that's not the batman show yeah i i feel bad because like i really want to like it more yeah but it just it's it's not as the clips sound very generic saturday morning cartoon to it to me because i I don't watch it but the just like the the dialogue that you have in like the clips sometimes is like oh yeah yeah i honestly i'm just picking those willy-nilly i'm not really picking those because i think they may i I, I used to do i used to do um music i would do the music for the episode but i can't find the dedicated music for episodes anymore Oh, gotcha. and so i've just been whatever clips i can find i'll just rip where that has sounds but most of them are like yeah I don't think so. So it's not very interesting, but but the uh, yeah, I mean the episodes are just they're fine. Yeah, they're not really doing anything groundbreaking. It's it's not as satisfying a watch through as as the the First animated ones. series was. Yeah, that's it. Thanks everybody for listening. Check out all the shows at thepenskyfile dot com. It's also on YouTube. Thank you for supporting the show at Patreon dot com slash thepenskyfile. We'll be back next week with Darkling. Thank you for listening and supporting the show. See ya.